What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another audiobook. Now, today we are going to be looking at Tales from the Pizzaplex number 8, B72. And this is really, really, really exciting to me because this is the final Tales from the Pizzaplex book. Can you believe it? And uh, it's going to be a direct continuation from B7. I was so confused when I first saw that this story was going to be continued. But, um,. I guess it kind of makes sense, right? I, I feel like B7 had, like, a very definitive ending, but I want to see if this can, like, live up to that original story, because I thought it was it was quite a good story, even though it was controversial, people thought it was transphobic, um, which is a shame. But we're going to get straight into this. Um, I do just want to say, first of all, that I am very sorry for being really, really delayed with audiobooks. So I, I remember I did... I did the audiobooks for the sixth book, which... Oh, no, no, I didn't. I, I did the audiobooks up to the Bobby Lot's conclusion, and then I didn't do Nexi, I didn't do Tiger Rock, and now I'm doing B72. So I will be going back to those, just in case people have missed those books. Um, so don't fret, I will be covering all of Tales from the Pizzaplex. I will be finishing all of the audiobooks, so don't worry. I've just been super, super busy, and I've had zero time at all to... Uh, to do any of these audiobooks. So, I hope that you enjoy this, and uh, let's just get started with the first story, B72. And if you don't remember what happened in B7, essentially, Billy was watching Freddy and Friends on the TV until uh, until one day he, he just started pretending to be a robot, right? And then he grew up. He, we, we saw a lot of his life as he as people realized that he had this like mental condition or something that made him believe he was actually a robot and he was drinking oil and stuff like that until he was he was at the point where he was all alone in his own family because his mother had committed suicide and uh it's a really sad story uh, and it ends with basically Billy replacing all of his body parts with metal body parts um synthetic um synthetic body parts and then uh and then going in the garbage disposal at the at the uh trash place <laughs> I, I forgot what it's called going to the garbage disposal because he realized then and there that he wasn't a robot and it was like such a big story at the time like it was it was not for not necessarily for law but it was a really cool story and really really sad so um hopefully it has the same themes. Anyway, let's get straight into it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I talk too much. The voices were far away, but getting closer. They were like scratchy static, marring the clarity of a perfect melody. Until the voices had intruded, Billy had been floating in a sweet haze of sensation-free bliss. Now the voices cut through that bliss, yanking Billy into a muddle of noise and pain. Billy threw up a hand, wanting to ward off the invading unpleasant feelings. His raised hand, though, brought even more pain, a sharp cutting sting. Billy gasped and opened his eyes. The pinpoint lights were blinding. He snapped his eyes shut again. The bliss was well and truly gone now. Billy's senses flooded with information, even though his closed eyelids... Uh, sorry, even through his closed eyelids, he could see the spears of bright light. He could hear loud chatter and a few shouts combined with an insistent and grating beep, the patter of footsteps and the occasional metallic clatter. He smelled the pungent scents of bleach and disinfectant, the acrid odour of urine, and the nauseating smell of overcooked vegetables, maybe broccoli and cabbage. He felt something pricking at the back of his right hand, but that was the least of the pain he felt. It seemed like nearly every nerve ending in his body was firing a barrage of throbs and aches and twinges, Everything hurt, and the taste in his mouth. Billy tried to move his tongue around to erase the bitterness that was so powerful, and he had to swallow down a gag. But then he remembered that he had very little tongue remaining. Only the barest nubbin of tissue was able to wiggle around in his mouth, and it could do nothing to wipe away the caustic flavour. Billy opened his eyes again. Turning his head away from the lights, he blinked several times and looked around. He was definitely in the hospital, but why? Frowning, Billy dug through his distorted memories. He saw himself looking in the mirror, gazing at his unnaturally square face and his mutilated body. He saw the floor of his home, and he remembered lying on it, crying. He saw his neighbourhood, and he remembered lurching through it, walking and walking. 
he saw a junkyard and an old station wagon, and he felt himself climbing into the back of it. The compactor, Billy thought. The last thing he remembered was the feeling of compression, a system-wide pain that blotted out all his sadness and regret. The memory acted like a catalyst, and now his mind replayed his recalled experience of listening to the rumble of the big machine that bore down on the car he's hidden in. That sound, for some reason, pulled him back into his identity. He instantly became aware of it all. He simultaneously integrated the personality of a boy who, whose play had turned into a years-long delusion and of a man who had re realised his horrible mistakes and had no face his remorse and safe and, and had to re oh my gosh, sorry, and had to face his remorse and self-hate. There's a few things I did actually forget to, um, to say at, at the beginning of this, which I usually say in, in the start, the most of all your books. First of all, I do mess up a lot, so I'm sorry. Uh, but this is supposed to be like a chill kind of like bedtime story kind of, um, kind of vibe rather than like a really dead set uh, robotic voice talking to you. Um, and, it, and if you do want like a robotic voice audiobook, then you can go and buy the audiobook uh, on Amazon or whatever. Uh, but I'm here doing it for free. Uh, so don't don't forget about that. Um, and also, also, this is just for this one and the next one. This is a complete reaction from me too. I have never read the summary of this story. So I have no idea what's going to happen. And I'm very excited to see. That compactor had been Billy's way out of all of it, his surrender. So how did he... Well, look who joined us, a perky voice cried out. Billy turned his head toward the open doorway. A compact woman with short, strawberry blonde curls and a heavily freckled oval face busted up to the side of the bed, uh, Billy lay in. The woman wore a bright blue cotton uniform. Maybe she was a nurse. Glancing at the beeping monitors, she put warm, smooth fingers against the back of Billy's right hand. And he could feel them. Why could he feel the nurse's fingers? As quickly as Billy had cycled through the mind pictures that reminded him of the last thing he remembered before being in his room, Billy's brain flooded him with an awareness of his life. Instantly, Billy knew that he had prosthetic limbs. Not synthetic, oh my god, I'm so stupid. He knew he did. And although the limbs often seemed real to him, he wasn't able to feel anything with them. Billy lifted his head so he could get a better view of his right arm. He groaned involuntarily when sudden dizziness and a pain, uh, and a knife-like pain made it clear that his head protested the sudden movement. Careful there, the nurse said. You've been through a lot, and you've been unconscious the whole time. You're going to feel discomfort and disorientation. Billy looked around, hoping to see the computer he'd used to communicate with after he, he had had his tongue removed. There was no computer. He'd have to try to talk. He opened his mouth, but the words he wanted to say wouldn't come out. Here, the nurse said. Your mouth has to be super dry. She reached over to a nightstand that Billy hadn't noticed when he'd looked around. Billy focused on the grey metal stand now, and he saw it held a mustard yellow plastic pitcher and a couple of small paper cups. One of the cups held water and a little sponge on a stick. The nurse moved the sponge, pulled a straw from her pocket, and put the straw in the cup. She held the straw to Billy's mouth. Go slow, she warned. Billy tentatively raised his head. This time, the room didn't spin as much, and the pain wasn't as intense. He used his lips to suck water through the straw. As he did, he glanced at the white name tag pinned to the nurse's uniform. Her name was Gloria. When Gloria pulled the straw away from Billy and set the cup back on the nightstand, he said, Thank you, Gloria. Or at least that's what he tried to say. What came out was actually more like, Thank you, Gloria. And the K was, was off. It wasn't crisp and clear. It sounded like something stuck in Billy's throat. Not bad, Gloria said brightly. Without a full tongue, you're going to have trouble with a lot of these letters. But don't worry, we'll get you set up with a speech therapist. That will help you out. Billy nodded, but he didn't care about that. He had so many questions he wanted answered now. How? he asked. What he really wanted to get out was, how did I survive being crushed in the car? But that was too many words. I'm going to call for Dr. Herrera, Gloria said. She's been in charge of your surgeries and has overseen your recovery. She'll explain everything. 
You'll like her. She's super nice. Gloria leaned over and checked the line that was connected to the back of Billy's right hand. Looking good, she said. But if the line starts to bug you, or you need something else, just press this. She pointed at a button on a small remote control that dangled from a thick white cord over the railing on the side of Billy's bed. Billy stretched out his fingers to make sure he could reach the button. He was in awe that his fingers were still there. Gloria walked around the bed and adjusted his covers. Then she patted his left leg. Billy widened his eyes in surprise. He could feel that too. How is that possible? Just hang tight, Gloria said. Dr. Herrera will be here in a jiff. A jiff turned out to be about half an hour. Billy was able to note the time because he could see a big black numbered clock on the wall above the nursing station outside his room. It was 1.42 p.m. when Gloria left the room and it was 2.14 when Dr. Herrera walked in. Even wearing a baggy white lab coat over the same blue cotton uniform that Gloria wore, Dr. Herrera looked more like a Hollywood star than a doctor. Dark skinned and black haired, the 30 something tall slender woman had large deep set heavily lashed brown eyes, sculpted cheekbones, a strong jaw and a full mouth with even white teeth. Obviously adept with makeup, Dr. Herrera had assented all her naturally beautifully be beautiful features perfectly. You can say that again. Billy thought that her smoky eye shadow and red lipstick made her look like she was ready for a photo shoot. He had never met a woman as stunning as Dr. Herrera. He'd only seen women like her in pictures or on TV. Billy, Dr. Herrera said with a smile as she approached his bed. It's wonderful to see you awake and alert. Dr. Herrera's deep, even voice was as warm as her eyes were. Billy, however, found himself tensing when, he, when she stepped up next to the bed, pulled a stethoscope from her pocket and put it to her ears. When she bent over him and pulled down the neck of the baby blue thin cotton hospital gown he wore, he held his breath. He suddenly was aware that the gown was only covering the front of him. He felt exposed and vulnerable, and he flinched as Dr. Herrera placed the hard cold end of the stethoscope against his bare chest. In spite of the way Dr. Herrera seemed nice, her white coat and stethoscope and her title, Doctor, immediately brought up memories of Doc, the grizzled old guy who turned Billy into the monster he discovered himself to be hours before he'd made his way to the junkyard. Billy knew that Doc had only done what Billy had asked him to do, but that didn't mitigate Billy's association of Doc with all the pain he'd gone through. Billy hated the idea of another doctor looming over him. He didn't want to be in the doctor's control. Your heart sounds good, Dr. Herrera said, straightening. Billy exhaled in relief when Dr. Herrera stepped away from his bed and pulled out the vinyl brown chair, which was straight-backed and didn't look comfortable, toward the foot of the bed. She placed the chair where Billy could easily see her without craning his neck, and she took a seat. Okay, Dr. Herrera said. Let's get you caught up on what's been going on. Sound good? Still feeling intimidated and wary, Billy managed a uh, nod. He needed to know what had happened, so he forced himself to stay calm and listen. Dr. Herrera clasped her large hands together. Okay, Dr. Herrera said again. She said the word with a long O sound. Okay. Dr. Herrera opened his mouth and then closed it. Perhaps we should start with what you remember, she said. In spite of his nervousness, Billy found himself relaxing a little. Dr. Herrera spoke with a slight accent. Billy thought it was maybe Spanish, and the ebb and flow of her words, words were strangely soothing, unlike mine. Billy cleared his throat. I remember going to the junkyard and getting in the old car, and I remember the car was being crushed. Those words were what Billy heard in his mind when he spoke, but what he heard in his ears was much different. Without a tongue, Billy could only clearly use a few letters. A, B, F, sorry, A, B, E, F, I, M, O, P, R, V, and Y, without distortion. Some letters, K, Q, U, and X, were close but somewhat garbled. The rest of the letters, those that required pressing his tongue to the roof of his mouth in any way, weren't accessible at all. Consequently, his speech was mushy and difficult to understand. Somehow, though, Dr. Herrera managed to grasp the gist of what Billy had said. That's what I thought, Dr. Herrera had said. After you were found, the police at first thought you'd been attacked and placed in the vehicle compactor against your will. 
they had to go to your home and investigate. When they did that, they found out the truth. Billy pressed his lips together. He hated the idea of strangers going through his things. He could feel his heart rate speeding up. He forced himself to breathe slowly. At least he didn't have to explain anymore. Why am I alive? Billy asked. Well, to start with, Dr. Herrera said, dumb luck, apparently. No one is sure why you survived the machine, but you did. And you were found just in time because the junkyard owner is a bird watcher. He said he spotted a rare bird on the hood of the station wagon. That's when he noticed blood coming out of, from under the wagon's back door. It was almost too late. You suffered severe injuries. You had a cracked skull, jaw, collarbone and pelvis, and your right arm and leg were, fla were fractured. You also had internal injuries, some damage to your liver, kidneys, spleen and gallbladder. Plus, you had a collapsed lung when they brought you in. In addition to that, you had all the modifications you underwent before the compactor injuries. We dealt with your injuries and we removed all the foreign materials and parts from your body in a series of surgeries. During that time and for several weeks after, we've kept you in a medically induced coma to, keep, to give your body the time it needed to heal. Dr. Herrera studied Billy's face, and your body has done a fine job, I have to say. Considering how much Billy hurt, he wasn't sure about that, but he didn't say anything. He was struggling to comprehend the fact that all the additions he'd made to his body had been removed. So why was so much of him still here? His memory told him that he'd been nearly entirely replaced with metal and wire and plastic. Glancing down at his clearly intact right hand, Billy had to question his take on what he'd done to himself. Obviously, he had it wrong, but why? Dr. Herrera shifted in the brown chair. Billy refocused on her. Some of the work you had done couldn't be undone, Dr. Herrera said. Your right leg and left arm were amputated. The exterior cartilage of your ears has been removed and most of your tongue is missing. The rest of your body, however, was integrated with the foreign material. Oddly, your left leg had been surgically altered to appear as if it had been amputated, and prosthetic materials had been incorporated with your flesh. According to the files the police found in your house, you asked the doctor to remove all your limbs, but it appears he got lazy, or maybe greedy. He took your money and didn't do one of the amputations. He just made modifications, so it appeared that the amputation was done. Dr. Herrera shook her head, and th then went on. The police raided the old mental hospital where your doctor did his surgeries, and they found body parts in the freezer. Not all were yours, but some were... But some were, <laughs> including your right arm. We were able to reattach parts where they're preserved well enough. Billy looked down at his right arm in awe. Dr. Herrera smiled and crossed her legs. As for the rest, Dr. Herrera said, when I removed all of what shouldn't have been there, it came out as one coherent piece. All the extraneous, extraneous, extraneous parts <laughs> held together with wires and your own connective tissue and flesh. Billy winced at the idea of what must have gone into removing that from his body and at the idea of losing even more of himself in the process. His stomach clenched. Dr. Herrera leaned forward and touched Billy's right hand. Billy thought she meant the gesture as one of comfort, but it made him stomach flip over again. He wanted to yank his hand away from her, but he was too scared. The idea of this woman slicing him open and taking out what had essentially been a cobbled together animatronic endoskeleton brought up memories of the time Billy had spent in Doc's basement. Billy couldn't contain a shiver, but Dr. Herrera didn't seem to notice it. The work that was done on you, Dr. Herrera went on, Although unconsciousable, uh, unconsci- unco wait, that's a weird word, unconscionable, unconscionable, there you go, and gruesome, was unlike anything I've seen. Because of that, I had to put what we removed in one of our storage vaults downstairs. Dr. Herrera cocked her head. Do you have any questions, Billy? Billy had a lot of questions, but he didn't want to ask any of them, still marvelling at, at his intact- right arm. He finally managed to lift it. Trailing the line that was inserted into the back of his hand, he brought his fingers to his face. Not sure what he'd feel, he tentatively ch touched his cheek. Would you like a mirror? Dr. Herrera asked. Billy hesitated, then nodded. I thought you might, Dr. Herrera said. She reached into the pocket of her white coat 
and pulled out a hand mirror. Standing, Dr. Herrera stepped toward the head of Billy's bed and held the mirror out in front of him. Billy took a deep breath and looked at his reflection. The last time Billy had inspected himself, what he'd seen was nothing like what he was seeing now. Gone were the hard edges created by the metal plating. Gone were the black eyes. Gone was the bare skull. Yes, Billy's ears were still missing, but other than that, he looked pretty normal. He even saw a bit of his dad in the small eyes and nose, round cheeks and wide mouth that he saw in the mirror. Oh, we're going to learn in the story that Billy's dad was actually a robot this whole time. <laughs> as it had been, uh, sorry, as it had when Billy was a child, Billy's brown hair was sticking up haphazardly in a variety of directions. His hair was maybe three inches long, obviously. He'd been in a coma for quite some time. If the hair itself hadn't been a hint of the past time, the condition of Billy's scars told the rest of the story. When Billy had imagined Dr. Herrera cutting into him and taking out all the extra parts, he'd envisioned jagged incisions, crusted with blood and tied with stark black thread. Instead, what he saw were faintly red scars bracketing his cheeks, forehead and jaw. Clearly he was well on his way to healing from his wounds. Billy tried to take the mirror from Dr. Herrera's hand, but he found that his fingers wouldn't work quite right. Dr. Herrera shifted the mirror as she gestured with her other hand at Billy's right arm. You're going to be a little stiff after being out for so long, she said. You got passive physical therapy while you were out, manual movement of your limbs to keep the muscles limber and prevent too much loss of muscle mass. However, you'll need physical therapy so you can learn to use a crutch with the right arm until your right leg is ready for a new prosthetic. Billy shook his head violently. No, he shouted. The word came out as long as a long and loud O. Oh. Billy locked his gaze on Dr. Herrera. No more prosthetics. The words sounded like O oh or rofefic. Dr. Herrera seemed to get it. She pulled the mirror away from him and stuck it back in her pocket as she soothed. It's okay, Billy. We won't do anything you don't want. She gently put a hand on Billy's shoulder. In spite of his fear of her, the touch felt good. Dr. Herrera backed up and sat down again. Obviously, she said, we had to do everything we did without your consent because you weren't able to give it. She leaned toward Billy. Some of my colleagues didn't think we'd be able to save you, but I knew we could. And we have, with a lot of help from you. She gestured at Billy's prone form. Your body's ability to heal has been quite extraordinary. You've come much further, much faster than anyone could have predicted. And I expect you'd get your strength back in no time. Our part is pretty much done. From here on out, with some exceptions, choices about what's done to continue your healing will be up to you. Billy scrunched up his forehead. Exceptions? He opened his mouth to try to form the word. Dr. Herrera held up a hand. I know what you're thinking. What exceptions, right? Billy nodded. Dr. Herrera nodded too. She took a long, deep breath and exhaled. I don't, want you, I don't want to overload you with too much right now, she said. You're still healing. But you might as well know that social services assigned you an advocate. Wait, what? Because of what the police found in your house, the state is requiring a psychological evaluation now that you're out of your coma. That's non-negotiable. But if you're deemed competent, you'll get, the, you'll get to call the shots going forward. Ooh. You'll get to call the shots. Dr. Herrera's words echoed in Billy's head long after she left his room. What would that be like now? Billy wondered. Would he be able to make good decisions about his life? The last thing Billy remembered before succumbing to the pain of the compactor had been a crushing feeling of loss. That was why letting the compactor press down on him felt so right, so welcome. Now Billy was being given a second chance. He could make a whole new set of decisions. He could have a whole new life. The life he'd thought he'd missed out on forever. That thought was both exciting and terrifying. Given that Billy couldn't remember choosing anything for himself that wasn't part of his animatronic delusion, he didn't know how to, how to decide what to do next. But he didn't have to face that right way. Uh, sorry, but he didn't have to face that right away. He would be in the hospital for a while longer. For that, Billy was grateful. Um, 
In the in just a short time Billy had been conscious in his barren hospital room, it had started to feel like a welcome haven. He liked its plain walls and its louvered blinds, which he'd asked Gloria to lower after Dr. Herrera left. Billy liked the little room, but the big blue sky outside felt threatening for some reason. All that sunshiny openness was too much for him to process. A couple hours after Dr. Herrera left him, Billy got to eat his first meal as his new self. Having spent most of his life eating the animatronic diet of only white foods, he was eager to try something new. Unfortunately, the evening meal was chicken and rice with green beans. The chicken and rice were familiar, and therefore unwelcome. But he eagerly dug into the green beans. They didn't taste as good as he'd hoped they would, but the red jello dessert was wonderful. In his new life, Billy decided he'd eat a lot of red foods. Ah, oh, it's the innocent logic of this that I love. I, I remember loving that part of it in B7 as well. It's like, it's just so sad to see. It's, it's amazing. It's really good writing. The second day of Billy's new life, he met his physical therapist, Angie, or Ang I'm going to say Angie, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, on one side of Angie's head, her hair was shorn into a buzz cut. On the other side, her hair was long and woven into a complicated braid. Angie didn't look like she was very strong, but Billy quickly found out that she was. Angie came into Billy's room carrying an armful of bandages, a leg brace and a crutch. Okay, Billy, she said after she'd introduced herself. We need to get you up on your feet, or foot, as the case may be. She grinned at him. Billy laughed, but his muscles were tense. Did he really want to try to stand up? Billy's memory of being on his feet wasn't a good one. He clearly remembered the way he'd careened down the sidewalk to the junkyard where he'd thought he was going to die, and that had been with both prosthetics. Now he had one leg still recovering from surgery, and the other leg was completely gone. How would he stand? I hear you. Angie said, or Angie said. You didn't, I, I didn't say anything, Billy said. You didn't have to. Your trepidation is written all over your face. Trepidation is a good word, Billy said. Glad you like it. Angie lowered the railing on the left side of Billy's bed. Earlier that morning, Gloria had removed all the lines that had connected Billy to the monitors that had clustered around his bed. Your vital signs are perfect, Gloria had said. Dr. Herrera says you don't need monitoring anymore. Gloria had then looked at Billy's IV. How's your pain? she had asked. Billy thought about it. He was surprised to realise that the aches and throbs he'd felt when he'd first woken up had abated a lot. He was sore, but he wasn't in agony. Not bad, he said. Good, Gloria said. You haven't had any meds going through this line since last night. Just glucose, and now you're eating on your own. So, let's get this thing out of you. She proceeded to remove the IV that had been poking into the, the back of his right hand. Billy was happy to get rid of that. Now that he was no longer plugged into anything, Billy could move more freely. Even so, he was wary when a Angie leaned over him and said, Go ahead and put your arm around my neck. The idea of doing this made Billy very uncomfortable. He felt hesitant and self-conscious. Come on, Angie said. Don't be shy. I'm tough, she grinned at him. Billy smiled. He did as she told him to. Over the next hour, Angie got Billy sitting up and then, after bandaging his remaining leg and encasing it in a black padded brace, she taught him how to use a crutch with his remaining arm. Between the crutch and the braced leg, Billy managed to not only stand but also walk out of his room and down the hall. You're amazing, Angie said at the end of the hour. Dr. Herrera said you healed unnaturally fast. She was right. Angie helped Billy get back into bed, which was harder than he'd thought it would be. Maybe he'd overdone it, he thought. Some of the pain he'd felt the day before was returning. You're probably going to be sore, Angie said. Using a crutch is no picnic. When you get new prosthetics, moving around will be a lot easier. Billy immediately felt the same horror he'd felt when Dr. Herrera had mentioned new prosthetics. He vehemently shook his head. I don't think I said that word right, but whatever. Uh, I don't want new prosthetics, he told Angie. Angie crossed her arms over her hot pink cotton uniform top. Why ever not? They'll give you a much better life. Billy kept shaking his head. 
Oh, I see what's happening here. I, I, Billy seems to be scared of anything that... He, he seems to be scared of old habits, right? Eating white foods, for one. Like, chicken isn't going to harm you, but because it's a white food, he's like, no, 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 that that was part of my old life, you know? That was part of the robot, the, the, the robot life, and I don't want to do that anymore. So he's now... Uh, he is taking trepidation in in a lot of these everyday tasks and stuff and um now when he's being asked about prosthetics which genuinely will help him even like it won't make him robot it it will he will still be a human of course um but like he he seems to be scared of that because of the past experience which which is understandable honestly which is understandable um he was surprised when his eyes even filled with tears Angie perched on the edge of Billy's bed. She put her hand lightly on his chest. It's okay, she said softly. Her voice was much gentler than it had been when she'd been barking orders at him while she, while she helped him learn to use the crutch. I get it, Angie said. I heard what happened to you. You went through hell. And if I was you, I'd feel the same way about adding something else to my body. But, Billy... Angie's voice softened even more. Before... You were using pr the prosthetics to try to be something you weren't. If you get them now, you'll be using them to become yourself again. Billy pursed his lips. He understood what Angie was saying, but the idea of doing anything else to his body was terrifying. You don't have to take any action now, obviously, Angie said. But if I were you, I would keep the option open. Revisit the idea when you get better. Billy nodded. He was too rattled to speak. Angie pushed off the bed and gave him a thumbs up. I'll be back in the morning for another torture session, she winked at him. That made Billy laugh. He decided he'd do what she suggested. Maybe sometime in the future he'd rethink the prosthetics. Aww. The third day of Billy's new life started with another walking session with Angie. In addition to helping him get more comfortable using the crutch, Angie showed him how to raise and lower the rails on his bed, and she had him practice three times, getting himself from the bed to the bathroom so he could use the toilet. Billy was surprised and pleased when he was able to manage that task. Not long after Angie had left him, Billy had the psychological evaluation Dr. Herrera had told him about. This was done by a grim-faced, bald man named Dr. Coleman, someone Billy didn't like at all. Dr. Coleman, Billy thought, didn't like Billy either. Dr. Coleman's questions were curt, and Dr. Coleman kept staring at Billy's ears, or rather, where Billy's ears should have been. Billy was glad when Dr. Coleman left. After Dr. Co How many times is it going to say Dr. Coleman? Uh, after Dr. Coleman had gone, Gloria came in to check on Billy. When she found him touching what re remained of his ears, she looked into his eyes. Are you okay? Dr. Coleman was di disgusted by my ears, Billy said. I could tell. Gloria rolled his eyes. H her eyes, sorry. Don't get me started on Dr. Coleman. But he's right, Billy said. My ears are ugly. Not ugly, Gloria said. Just different. I need a hat, Billy said. Gloria shook her head. Billy crossed his arms and nodded. Gloria shrugged. I'll see what I can do. She winked at him and trotted out of the room. An hour later, Gloria bought Billy his lunch, a ham sandwich on pumpernickel bread, and a little pile of raw carrots with ranch dip. Billy was familiar with ranch dip, but ham and pumpernickel were new to him. What the hell is pumpernickel? <laughs> he liked them both. He also enjoyed the carrots. He had a dim recollection of eating carrots when he was very little, but he'd forgotten how sweet they were. Orange foods would be good in his diet too, he concluded. And brown foods were going to be a must. Billy's dessert and chocolate pudding, which was the best thing he'd tasted so far in his new life. He loved chocolate. The second he tasted it, he remembered eating chocolate ice cream when he was little. How could he have gone so long without chocolate? That alone was hard to imagine. After lunch, Gloria came to get Billy's tray. Before she picked it up, she said, close your eyes. Billy blinked, but complied. As soon as he did, he felt Gloria's warm hands against the side of his head. Something soft came down over the top of his head. Gloria's hands went away. Okay, she said. Open your eyes. Billy opened his eyes. Gloria was, o was holding a small mirror in front of his face. In the mirror, he saw that he was now wearing a multicoloured striped hat. It's a Rasta beanie hat, Gloria said. 
one of my co-workers crochets them. Billy turned his head to one side and then the other. He grinned. This is great, he said. And it was. The hat, made of fine threads that felt lightweight and not too warm, covered his missing ears, and the bright colours made him look like he felt a lot better than he did. Thank you, Billy said. Gloria patted his shoulder. You're very welcome. She picked up his tray, waved at him and left the room. After Gloria left, Billy kept touching his new hat. It made him smile. The hat had been a big surprise, but what happened next was an even bigger surprise. Billy started getting visitors. Oh. For the three years prior to the end of his animatronic life, the three years after his mother had died, Billy had lived a pretty isolated life. Other than Malaya, his online girlfriend for just a short time, and a couple of delivery people, Billy hardly interacted with anyone. He suddenly hadn't had any friends. The new Billy, though, was going to have people in his life. This, he decided, after enjoying a day's worth of surprise visitors. The first person who came to see Billy was Dr. Lingstrom. Oh yeah, of course. Billy hadn't seen Dr. Lingstrom since his mum had died three years before. Dr. Lingstrom hadn't changed much in that time. Still wearing big glasses and piling her auburn her hair on top of her head in a large bun, Dr. Lingstrom's smile was wide when she rushed into Billy's room and came to his bedside to give him a hug. I've missed you, Dr. Lingstrom said as she bent over Billy. Unable to hug Dr. Lingstrom back because she was pinning his one arm to his side with her upper body, Billy just smiled and said, as best as he could, you too. He realised this was true, even though he never really enjoyed his time with Dr. Lingstrom and she'd never seemed to like anything he'd said or done, he felt a strange affection for the woman who'd asked, who used to ask him so many questions about why he wanted to be a robot. Now, of course, Billy understood that Dr. Lingstrom had been trying to help him see through his delusion. The fact that she hadn't been able to do that wasn't going to be something Billy held against her. Intuitively, Billy understood he was going to need help to be the new version of himself. He was happy Dr. Lingstrom might be around to give him that help, so much so that he even said as much. I want to be a new man, Billy told Dr. Lingstrom after she took a seat in the brown chair. Can you help me with that, Dr. Lingstrom? <laughs> his lack of tongue mangled her name, but he did his best. Dr. Lingstrom smiled widely. I'd love to, Billy, but don't call me doctor. I won't be helping you as a doctor. You've aged out of my patient pool. I'm a child psychologist. However, I'm happy to help you as a friend. You can call me Alice. Billy frowned. That would be a tough name for him. <laughs> Two of its pivotal sounds were ones he couldn't form. Dr. Lingstrom noticed the frown. Oh, she said. What am I thinking? She waved the air and laughed. Silly me. Call me Ahi. <laughs> it will be your nickname for me. Billy grinned. He'd never called someone by a nickname before. The next hour was maybe the happiest hour Billy could remember since he was a little kid. And he was sorry when it was over. But after Dr. Lingstrom, no, Ahi, left, Billy was even more surprised by his next visitors. Some peaceful grey clouds were starting to blot out the sun when two young men, probably about Billy's age, his true age, not his animatronic age, stepped through his open doorway. Eager to meet new people, ah, oh, let, me, let me guess, they're from his class, they're from his school. Eager to meet new people, Billy looked at the men expectantly, but he didn't think he knew them. No, wait, he did know them. Clark, Billy said to the shorter of the two guys. The name came out as Ark. Hey, Billy, Clark said. He gave Billy a big toothed grin and Billy's mind flashed to an image of a little red headed boy pretending to be a robot in kindergarten. Billy grinned back. Hi, Clark. Clark was still a redhead, but he wasn't little anymore. Short, yes, but he was well muscled. His chest was huge. Good to see you, Billy. Clark's companion said, cool hat. Thanks. Hi, Peter. Billy said. He laughed when he realised his version of Peter's name sounded like Pia. Sorry, he continued, struggling his way through the words he wanted to say. No tongue. No problem, Peter said. We heard. That surprised Billy. How had his old friends heard about his tongue? Peter, who was now six foot two and lanky with the long black ponytail, pointed a finger at Billy. You're a big deal, he said. Everyone's talking about you. Billy frowned. He wasn't sure he liked that idea. Why? he asked. 
Peter walked over and dropped into the brown chair. Are you kidding me? You're the robot boy who survived being crushed. I'm not a robot, Billy said. It was the first time Billy had said the words out loud, and he wasn't sure how he felt about them. Part of him was happy he no longer felt like a robot. Part of him, though, was lost without his robot self. Billy's body felt so strange to him now. Billy wasn't the animatronic he'd gotten to, used to being, and he wasn't the child he'd been before he tried to change himself. He was something in between the two, something that felt strange and incomplete. Peter's laughter was loud in the small room. I'm glad to hear you say that, Peter said. You were pretty far out there for a while. Pete, Clark snapped, stepping over from the end of Billy's bed. Clark smacked Peter on the shoulder. What? Peter said in mock innocence. He was. He was in Looneyville. For the next few minutes, they tried to one-up each other with silly names for Billy's years, trying to be an animatronic. Maybe Billy should have been hurt by the teasing, but he wasn't. His friends were treating him like one of the guys. That helped him feel a little less lost and scared. After a short visit, Billy's old friends left. Before they did, they made sure he had their phone numbers and their addresses. Clark and Peter were, ro were rooming together in an apartment near the local college. They were both juniors. Call us if you need anything, Clark said. We'll be back to visit you again, Peter said. Maybe you can tell us what it was like to be a robot. Clark swatted Peter again as the two left the room. Billy, who had smiled for most of the visit, felt his smile fade at the reminder of his lost years. Billy would always carry the scars of his time as a would-be animatronic. Would he carry the stigma as well? Oh, I actually feel so sad for this kid. <laughs> Within a few minutes of Clark's and Billy, sorry, at Clark and Peter's exit, Billy got two more visitors, Ned and Fran, two of the people who used to deliver groceries and other things to Billy's house, came in together. Billy was shocked to see them. He was especially surprised to see that they bought a big bouquet of Get Well balloons. As soon as he saw the balloons, Billy remind, remembered the rude and dismissive way he had treated Ned and Fran. Trying so hard to be a robot, Billy had been distant and aloof, and he'd never tipped them. Thinking about what a jerk he'd been, Billy blurted, I don't deserve those. Ned and Fran weren't able to understand Billy, so they, fl they flagged down Gloria to help. Because she'd been talking to Billy since he'd awakened, she'd gotten used to the way she spoke. She translated for Billy as he apologised to Ned and Fran for how he'd been with them. Both of them waved away his words. No worries. Fran, a tall, broad-shouldered woman with brown hair cut chin length, said, We understand. She ex exchanged a glance with Ned. We heard about what happened to you and we wanted to come and let you know we care. Ned, who had shaggy blonde hair and was tall and broad-shouldered as Fran but much heavier, looked at his big feet. Billy still had a feeling Fran might have dragged Ned to the hospital. Nez looked up. I always felt kind of sorry for you, dude. You seemed so lonely. Billy's eyes suddenly filled with tears. He blinked them away. Ned was right. Billy had been lonely. He just never let himself face that fact. He'd used his obsession with, let with getting his animatronic appearance right to cover how disconnected he'd felt from the world around him. And despite these visits... Billy still felt connect disconnected. He was the guy who'd spent 16 years trying to be a robot. He had no tongue, no ears, and he was missing two limbs. He also had scars all over his face. Would he ever feel like he was part of the world? Ned and Fran didn't stay long. After they left, Gloria brought Billy's dinner, spaghetti and meatballs, which Billy liked a lot. He got more p chocolate pudding after that, and then he got the biggest surprise visitor of all if not the most welcome one. Billy was finishing up his pudding when he looked up and saw a short, stick-thin, stern-faced, grey-haired woman standing in his doorway. Skinny arms crossed over a crisp yellow floral blouse under a royal blue cardigan sweater that matched blue polyester slacks. Billy's grandma gazed at him with her small lips compressed. Grandma, Billy breathed. The word came out as ra -a. His grandma shook his head. It's a crying shame, she said as she inspected him from head to toe. Billy dropped the pudding cup on the tray that was pulled up to his chest. The cup started to roll across the tray's laminate surface. It headed toward the tray's edge. 
Billy's grandma strode into the room and grabbed the pudding cup an inch before it would have fallen onto the floor. Writing the cup, she leaned over Billy and gave him a cool-lipped kiss on the forehead. The scents of vanilla and gardenias filled Billy's nostrils. He was immediately transported back to his childhood. Time for Sunday school, his grandma said, marching into his room and shaking her head at the toys scattered across the floor. Billy's dad followed Billy's grandma into Billy's room. He doesn't like Sunday school any more than I did, Ma, Billy's dad said. That's neither here nor there, Billy's grandma said. Sunday school isn't optional. Did you hear what I just said? Billy's grandma asked, extric extricating him from his memory. She'd sat herself in the brown chair and she had her knees primly together. A square pink purse sat in her lap. Billy shook his head. Sorry, he said. No. I said I'm glad you've come to your senses. His grandma shook her head. Maybe I should have insisted. But your mother... She shook her head again. Well, no matter. What's past is past. I'm here now. Billy wasn't sure that was a good thing. But for the next 20 minutes, he listened politely as his grandma told him about her retirement from a job as an administrative assistant seven years before on her 17th, 75th birthday, not her 17th. I worked for as long as they'd let me, she said. I liked the work and I thought I hate being idle. But I found I enjoy my peace and quiet. I kept myself busy reading, baking. Um, what the hell? Sorry, something weird just happened. I kept myself busy reading, baking, painting and puttering in my garden. Billy wasn't sure what to say to the woman he remembered as a grumpy presence in his life. He was almost, a, she was almost a stranger to him. Billy hadn't seen his grandma for over 15 years. Even though she had some of his dad's and Billy's own features, the round cheeks and small eyes, she felt like a stranger to him. At the end of 20 minutes, Billy's grandma looked at her watch and stood. Gazing down at Billy, she nodded once as if reaching a decision that she didn't share. We'll get to know each other, she said. You just concentrate on getting well. And then she left. Billy let out a long pent up breath. His grandma made him nervous, but it didn't matter. Overall, it had been a good day. Billy couldn't believe he'd had so many visitors. When was the last time he'd seen this many people? Billy sat back and closed his eyes. He was worn out from the day's excitement, and he was struggling with a tangle of emotions. Although Billy's visitors had been a nice surprise, they'd unsettled him. Who was he now? He wasn't a robot anymore. But was he fully Billy? He felt like he was missing parts of himself, and he didn't know how to find them. But even with his parts missing, Billy knew one thing. He was glad to be alive. Oh, this is so sweet so far. Um... I would I I would argue it's it's sweet and it's it's very sad in a good way, but it's quite a slow start. I I feel like we're like I, I think we're like a third in th in through the story and and literally nothing has happened. So I'm wondering where this is this is going to go exactly. I remember I had predictions for this story a while ago and it was going to be basically this uh, this cynical plot about Billy wanting to be human again. But he was a robot, so it was basically the reverse of B7, where he would, like, kill people and take their human bodies, but uh, their human body parts, and then make himself human again. And I thought that was going to be a story, but no, apparently not. It's going to be it's gonna be something very, very, very different to what I expected. But uh, I, I don't dislike it. I don't dislike it. Billy had learned that hospitals weren't all that conductive to a good night's sleep, even though his own room was dark. The nurses left the door to his room open and a sickly greenish light spilled in through the doorway. The hospital was quiet, but Billy wasn't left in peace to sleep. Every hour or two, a nurse, not Gloria, but a rotation of three women, so nondescript that Billy wasn't sure he'd have been able to describe them if asked to do so, would come in to take his pulse or give him medication. On the third night, though, no nurses came in to bother Billy. Or maybe he was just so afraid after all his visitors that he hadn't noticed when they did. Billy fell asleep quickly, and when he woke up, the clock on the wall above the nurse's station read 2.24am. He'd been asleep for over five hours. And why was he awake now? Billy shifted positions on the bed, turning onto his right side. As he moved, he heard his name being called. Billy froze. He lifted his head and peered out into the pukey green light that filled the hall. 
No one was at the nurse's station. He heard no footsteps or voices. Where were all the nurses? Billy started to settle back down again, but then he heard his name again, faint and eerie, almost surreal. Billy, a voice called out, drawing out each of the letters. The sound raised all the hairs on his body. He could feel the prickles on every inch of his skin, even on the skin that was no longer there. It felt like his whole body had turned into a pin cushion, pierced by... In, into a pin cushion, sorry. Not a pin cushion. <laughs> That's a cushion. A pin cushion, pierced by thousands and thousands of needles. Billy shivered as the blood began pumping through his veins faster and faster and faster. Billy... The voice crooned again. Billy sat up. Billy didn't want to sit up. What he wanted to do was curl up in a ball and pull the covers over his head. His shivers were turning into quivers that were so violent that his teeth began to chatter. But still, Billy sat up. He also reached across his body with the right hand and lowered the rail on the left side of his bed the way Angie had showed him. Billy's name was called again. He reached for the crutch that leaned against the foot of his bed and tucked it under his right arm. Billy stood, balancing his weight between the braced left leg and the crutch. A draft from his open doorway reminded Billy that his hospital gown was flapping open in the back. He let go of the crutch and balancing himself between his one leg on the floor and his hip against the side of the bed, he reached out with his right hand and overlapped his hospital gown, fumbling to tie it tight enough to keep the cool air out and his bare backside in. For several seconds, Billy held himself still, listening. Outside Billy's room, the hallway was unusually silent. The only thing Billy could hear was his own rapid breathing. Then he heard his name again, called in the same drawn-out way, in the same hush. Billy followed it compulsively. Although Billy could get around with one leg and the crutch, he didn't do it smoothly or quickly yet. The strain of using muscles that had been idle for a long time made his gait herky-jerky, and the exertion caused him to pant heavily. Billy heaved himself out into the empty hallway and blinked up at the strange green-tinged lights. They cast an unnatural glow over all of the grey and white expanses that filled the hall. Billy looked at the empty nurse's station. The station was a U-shaped white desk that contained several computers and metal filing baskets stuffed with papers. Four rolling grey desk chairs were bunched together a few feet from the desk, it had never been empty before. Billy turned away from the abandoned nurse's station and looked up and down the hall. The linoleum floor was primarily pale grey, but a wide dusky blue stripe ran down the middle of the hall. He had used that stripe to help him walk straight with Angie. Every time Billy had been out in the hall with Angie, it had been busy, filled with patients shuffling along with their IV stands, visitors carrying flowers or balloons, and nurses rushing from one room's wide doorway to the next. But now Billy saw no one. The hospital was unusually still. Now that he was out in the hallway, though, Billy realised he could hear something other than his breath. A rhythmic beeping and whooshing sound came from a long way off, and so did the, and so did the occasional scrape and thunk. And there was his name again. Billy. Billy cocked his head and tried to pinpoint where that sound was coming from. He looked down. He thought the origin of the voice was under him, maybe on one of the lower floors of the hospital. Billy looked along the length of the hall again. His gaze landed on the grey metal doors of the elevator at the end of the hall. He turned and headed that way. While Billy concentrated on keeping his balance steady between his leg and his crutch as he followed the blue stripe down the hall, he asked himself repeatedly what he was doing. Why was he going toward a sound that was totally unnerving him? Nothing about the way his name was being used was encouraging or soothing. Billy really didn't want to face whomever was calling him, but he couldn't seem to resist the summons. It felt like it reached right into the corner of him, tied itself to his will, and dragged him toward it. He had no choice but to go. It took just a few minutes for Billy to reach the elevator. There, struggling to catch his breath, he started to prop himself against the wall so he could push the elevator button. Before he could do that, though, the elevator door whisked open. Billy. The call, seemed, uh, the call si still seemed to be coming from below Billy. It remained faint but insistent. Billy's heart rate went up even more when he looked into the empty grey carpeted and blue cloth panel elevator car. Why had the elevator stopped for him? Billy tried to control his racing thoughts. 
It was weird, sure, but maybe there was a reason why the elevator had stopped. Billy stepped into the deserted car which smelled like coffee and pine-scented cleaner. He painstakingly turned himself so he could look at the control panel. The elevator doors made a sucking sound as they slid closed. Before Billy could decide which button to push, the elevator vibrated and began to descend. Billy frowned and looked up at the numbers above the door, watching the numbers tick down. When the L lit up, Billy expected the doors to open. He hadn't pushed a button in time, so of course it had returned to the lobby. But the elevator kept going down. Now the number display read B1, then B2, then B3. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> uh, it's going down to B7. The elevator door whooshed open. Billy squinted against the harsh yellow light, spilling into the dim elevator car car's interior. The light was so glaring, he didn't notice the janitor in the olive green uniform standing there until the janitor threw out an arm to hold the elevator door open. You getting out? The heavy-set, wavy-haired man asked as he repositioned a cleaning cart with a bucket, a mop and several other maintenance supplies. Billy nodded and the man stepped back to give Billy room to manoeuvre through the open doorway. Billy was afraid the man might ask what Billy was doing down here, but he didn't. The man's expression was blank, even sleepy, as he entered the elevator, pulling the cart along with him after Billy exited. Billy got a whiff of body odour and spearmint gum when the janitor passed him. Billy! Now the voice, though still slightly muted, was clearer. Billy looked down the narrow beige-tiled hallway. Unlike the wide, clean hallway on the seventh floor, seven, <laughs> B7, this one was confined and dingy. As Billy moved away from the elevator, the hall's overhead fluorescent lights dimmed. Many of them were flickering, and they all emitted a buzz that did nothing to mask the sound of Billy's name when it was sung out again. Billy could now tell that whoever was calling him was at the end of the creepy hall. Billy could feel a pull of the voice even more strongly. He knew that it came from behind a closed brown metal door at the end of the hall. As soon as the door clicked closed behind Billy, he sucked in his breath and let out a small whine. Billy. Billy's gaze whipped toward one of the long cabinet doors on the back wall of the small room. Leaning on his crutch, he lifted his right hand and wiped sweat from his forehead. Then he re-gripped his crutch and took three steps forward. Stopping, he once again propped himself up with a crutch, his hand trembling noticeably. He reached for the chrome handle on the cabinet door. Even as Billy grasped the metal, or the cool metal, he could hear his own voice shouting at him in his head. Not hampered by a missing tongue, Billy's inner voice sounded the way he remembered he used to sound, and its message was crystal clear. No, don't open that. Billy knew why the wiser part of him wanted him to leave the cabinet door closed. He knew because he also now knew, with terrifying clarity, what waited for him behind that door. Maybe Billy had known all along. Maybe he had known the second he'd first heard his name sung. What lay inside the long cabinet, a cabinet that looked, Billy now admitted to himself, not so much like a cabinet but more like a morgue drawer, was the other half of Billy. Even though the drawer was closed, Billy felt like he could see into it. He could see the excised part of himself. All the metal and plastic materials that he's added still clinging to pieces of flesh and tissue Dr. Herrera had had to remove from Billy in order to get all the robotic components out. This animatronic creation, which he'd worked so hard to embrace, was crying out to him, begging Billy to reclaim it. That's interesting. It seems to be another instance of, like, soul-splitting, I, I guess. I, I mean, we're going to see where this goes, but it, it's quite interesting to see how, I guess, like, the remnant or the agony of Billy seems to be in, in two different places at once. It seems to be kind of calling out to him from one body and actually living within another. Like, it, it's, it's really strange, uh, but we'll, we'll see where this goes. Um, Billy, however, didn't want to take back the pieces of the life he regretted living. He wanted to move on. He wanted to be Billy, the man, not B7, the robot. It didn't seem to matter what Billy wanted, though. His hand tugged the cabinet door open. Suddenly, a larger hand clamped down over Billy's. The hand was hot and collused and strong. What do you think you're doing in here? A rough voice demanded. Billy let go of the cabinet door handle as if it had suddenly 
superheated. He turned to look up into the narrow eyes of a large, dark-haired man with an imposing full beard. You're not supposed to be in here, the man said. Billy wanted to slug the man for stopping him. He also wanted to hug the man for stopping him. He did neither. He dropped his gaze to the man's dark blue uniform. A nameplate on the man's shirt pocket said he was Paul, hospital security. Come on, Paul said, studying Billy's hospital gown, then lifting his gaze to give Billy's striped beanie a bemused look. You need to go back to your room. Billy wanted to argue, but more than that, he wanted to do exactly what Paul said. Ah, I think, I think this is going to be a common theme of um, kind of like Sun and Moon, Vanessa Vanny. Two halves of one person contradicting each other, the angel and the devil on the shoulder. This is interesting. Billy nodded meekly and began to turn to follow Paul out of the little room. As Billy turned, his gaze landed on a narrow dark gap between the long cabinet door and the cabinet's interior. Billy had managed to open the drawer a couple inches. It remained open as the guard ushered Billy out into the hallway. Of course, to go with that theme, I just thought um, we also have the Monty within if you think about it. Um, but if you haven't read that story yet, I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> uh, I, I will be doing audiobook, so I will be doing an audiobook, so you can wait. Billy's eye shot open. He squinted into the two faint streams of light that illuminated just enough for him to make out some squat shapes. Billy clenched his fists and found his fingers curling around crisp, cool fabric. That's That was a really cool line, just because of the alliteration there. His hospital bedsheet, Billy exhaled. He was back in his room. One pool of light had slipped in through a seam in the room shades, and another came from the hallway. It was just a sliver, barely sneaking through the slender opening of his nearly closed door. Why was the door nearly closed? The nurses always left it wide open. Billy pressed his hands to his temple. His head was thro throbbing, so was his leg. His expedition to the basement had definitely been more exertion than his body could handle, but he'd had to go. The animatronic had given him no choice. Billy shuddered. Was that why he'd woken up? Had something in his dream reminded him of nearly coming face to face with the parts of himself he was happy to be rid of? Had the voice returned? How much time had passed since he'd been in the basement? It couldn't have been more than an hour, not based on the darkness in his room. And his body still ached, like he hadn't had time to rest. Billy started to roll over and pulled the covers up over his shoulders. He wanted to forget the trip to that little room with the long metal drawers. He wanted to click. Billy froze. The clicking sound had come from within the room. It had reached out of the darkness, stretching toward Billy from a place not nearly far enough away. And it was coming even closer. Click, clickety click, 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 click. Under the clicking, Billy could hear a slippery squelch. The sound was wet and sinister. It sounded like something hard was unyielding. Uh, it sounded like something hard and unyielding was oozing through something sodden. Oh my god, it's Fazgu. <laughs> the return of Fazgu. The return we all wanted. Click, swish, clickety click, swish, click, click, click. Stealing himself. Um, Billy shifted his weight and raised his head. He peered over his bed's railing and looked in the direction of the sounds. Billy gasped. In the pale shaft of light... Coming from his slightly open door, he could see a dark smeared trail. The trail was made up of two substances, one shiny and dark red, and the other vicious and black. <gasps> black. Agony. Okay, so if you don't remember, at the end of Animatronic Apocalypse, there seemed to be an oil-like substance that came from... Oh my god, what's his name? What was his name? The teacher. Ah, oh, I've forgotten his name. That's unfortunate. I'm usually pretty good with names in these stories, but I've forgotten his name. Um, yeah, the 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 teacher in Animatronic Apocalypse ends up being stabbed in the heart or something, and then it turns out that he was he he was like he he was bleeding black liquid or something, and then he just disappeared. Uh, and that relates obviously to the agony that we see all the way through Fazbear Frights, aka the, the tear streaks that go down the face of the Citrates victims, which also correlates with Night Marion, wink wink. And then just, we, we, we do have a lot of connections between like black and shadow, 
and uh, an agony. And so I want you to remember that while we're reading this, because I have a feeling that this is some sort of agony incarnation or reincarnation of um, of B7. of or, Yeah, actually of B7 rather than Billy that is coming back to fight him. Oh, that makes so much sense. I know where the story is going. It's going to be Billy versus B7, right? It's going to be the two opposing forces that have been such a um, such a battle in the original story. Do you stick with the human Billy or do we stick with B7, the robot? Uh, and that's that's interesting that it's now become like an agony manifestation, especially... Uh, considering like Eleanor and Afton and and how Eleanor is most likely Afton's manifestation of agony. That's really interesting. That's a cool thought process that I just went down and maybe we'll have to talk about it in a future video. Let me just take a drink. Because that was a lot of talking. <laughs> Whether it was good talking or not, let me know in the comments. All right. In the pale shaft of light, he had a trail of made up of two substances, one dark red and the other viscous and black. Billy breathed in sharply and his nostrils told him what he was looking at. He took in the rotting stench of human flesh and the bitter smell of motor oil. Ah, see there was a whole debate with Animatronic Apocalypse whether the oil-like substance was actually oil or not. I, I don't think it was oil, I think it said that it, it looked like oil. But uh, it, it could have been oil, I guess. Um, Billy knew exactly what hit, what was slithering his way. Maybe he had known since the first click. He opened his mouth and screamed. Scrabbling for his bed rail, Billy threw his leg off the bed as soon as the metal bars were out of the way. He grabbed his crutch the second his foot, foot touched the floor, and he launched himself from his bed a half second after that. Billy continued to scream as he flailed toward his door. Behind him, the clicking sped up. The slippery sounds got louder. Billy smacked the door open with his crutch and surged into the hallway, bellowing at the top of his lungs. He saw with relief that a nurse was now at the nurse's station, but he didn't stop for help. Billy knew he couldn't explain his terror quickly enough, and he couldn't risk the animatronic finding him. He hobbled down the hall as fast as he could go. Billy didn't make it very far, as he reached the corner of the hallway, about 20 feet from his door. A security guard... A different one than the one who had found Billy in the little basement room, this one was shorter and balding, suddenly loomed in front of Billy. What's all the racket? The guard asked. Billy didn't answer him. He just attempted to keep going. He wanted to get as far from the thing in his room as possible. The guard, however, wouldn't let Billy flee any further. He wrapped a thick arm around Billy's waist, and when Billy started trying to use his crutch to whack the guard's leg, the guard knocked the crutch from Billy's grasp and called out, A little help here! Weak from, his bed in, weak from his time in bed, Billy was no match for the guard's strength. Even though he writhed in the guard's grasp, the guard easily lifted Billy off the ground. Being picked up fired all Billy's flight-or-fight systems. He shrieked even louder and he twisted and churned. His panic robbed Billy of any ability to focus on his surroundings. All he could see were moving flashes of colour, and all he could hear were his own caterwauls. In the midst of this chaos, Billy felt himself being lifted even higher. Then, suddenly, he was lying prone. Once he was in this position, he felt his arms being pun pinioned. After that, he realised he was in motion. Whatever he was lying on was rolling down the hallway. They were taking him back to his room. No! Billy shouted. There's something in my room. Unfortunately, what Billy said sounded like, oh, air own being in my room. <laughs> Billy tried again. Please don't. There's something in my room. This came out no better. P O hair oming I I room. Through the confusion of movement, Billy spotted her nurse's uniform. Maybe it was one of the nurses who could understand him. He zeroed in on her wide eyes and he tried to throw her a pleading look. Either the nurse didn't understand Billy or she didn't believe him. She did nothing to stop what was happening. Hoarse and starting to choke on his own spittle, Billy stopped yelling. His chest heaved. A few seconds passed in a continued blur of confusion. Then Billy felt his body land on his hard hospital bed mattress. More chaos. Billy felt something stretching across his chest and his hips. A sting bit into his arm. More pressure. Something cold pressed against his right wrist. Then all the movement stopped. Billy blinked several times and looked around. 
In the light spilling in the, uh, into the room from the hallway, he could see that he was back in his room, alone. Billy tried to move, but he couldn't. Lifting his head, he looked down at his body. They'd strapped him to the bed. Billy was restrained. Not only that, whatever they'd given him was starting to make him feel woozy. His head felt heavier than it should have, and it felt like the air around him was thick and spongy. Sudden drowsiness made his eyes flutter. The light from the hallway disappeared. Someone had closed his door. Now only the faintest glow came from the nightlight above Billy's bed. It threw out a purple... Uh, purple? It threw out a pale yellow light that barely reached the bed's railings. Billy moaned. He squirmed, trying to loosen his bonds. Please, Billy said to the empty room. He wasn't sure who he was appealing to, but it didn't matter. No one answered him. No one came to help. Click, swish, clickety, click, swish, click, click, click. Billy moaned again. The thing was still here, and it was much, much closer. I went back in. The voice was the same one that had called Billy's name. The voice was darkly musical and raspy, contorted as if it came through a damaged synthesizer, which, of course, it did. The last time Billy had spoken as B7, he'd used the external synthesizer in his computer. A couple days before that, though, Doc had implanted a speaker in Billy's throat, the speaker had its own synthesizer, but Billy hadn't been able to get it to work before he'd broken down and fled his house. The clicking and slippery sounds moved away from Billy's bed. They skittered into the far corner of the room and then scurred back again. Please, the voice wheedled. Won't you let me back in? I've missed you so much. We were buddies, weren't we? You and me? We're supposed to be together. Billy lay perfectly still. He didn't respond to the voice. Something jostled Billy's bed. He stifled a gasp as he tried to raise his head so he could see the thing that spoke to him. But Billy couldn't make out what was clicking and sliding over the floor. Please let me back in, the voice urged again. You need me. Look what they've done to you. It's so sad. You're tethered like an animal. I can help you if you invite me back in. Come on, B7. We're better together. You know we are. Oh, the temptation... The clicking got louder and the bed vibrated again. Billy strained his neck. And there, he saw it. A vaguely human-shaped metal and plastic head rose up above the side of Billy's mattress. Billy heard a whimper gurgle in the back of his throat as he stared at bits of bloody flesh and tissue that clung to a tangled mass of metal plates and other mechanical parts. As grisly as the thing was, Billy couldn't stop staring at it. At it as two of the plates parted and spoke again. I'm your friend, B7, it said. I want to help you. Everyone in your life has failed you. No one else helped you when you were alone. They only took from you. They stole from you. They tried to control you. I just want to work with you. We're a team. Billy wanted desperately to block out his words. He wanted to cover his ears, but his hands were bound. The ghastly fleshy metal mass dropped out of Billy's view. More clicking make, made it clear that the thing was moving around to the other side of the bed. You know what you really are, B7, the thing said as it clicked. I only want you to be happy, and to be happy, you have to live your true life. Your true life is as an, um, is as an, um, oh my gosh, I can't speak today. Your true life is as an animatronic. We're meant to be together. We were designed to be as one. Billy jerked his hand back and forth, trying to free himself. He thrashed against the strap over his chest. His efforts were futile. He couldn't get loose. The remote control, Billy thought. He could call for a nurse. Stretching out his fingers, Billy tried to find the remote. He couldn't. It must have been out of his reach. He was helpless. Billy was having trouble staying awake too. Whatever they'd injected him with was working its way into its consciousness. His focus was slipping away. His senses were getting duller and duller. Please, B7, the thing said. I have your best interests at heart. You have to listen to me. No, I don't, Billy thought. And he was right. Billy gave in to the fog that was filling his mind. Closing his eyes, he fell asleep. Sunlight intruded into Billy's soft grey world. The effect of it was like cold water in the face. Billy woke fully, abruptly. Asleep one second and totally alert the next, Billy went into a panic. Feeling like he should be alarmed, but not sure why, Billy's hand groped around. He found the remote that hung on the rail of his bed. He pushed the button that would call Gloria to him. 
She'd tell him why he felt so frightened and threatened. Gloria was in Billy's room within seconds of her summoning her. You poor, poor thing, Gloria cried as she trotted towards Billy, toward Billy's bed. I heard you had some excitement last night. She hurried to Billy's side and patted his shoulder. At least Gloria was still on his side. Billy was freaked out for reasons he didn't understand, but his freakout level was dropping a few notches. What happened last night? Billy asked. He knew something had, but he could only hold on to wisps of images, of nightmares. Gloria moved away from the bed and reached for the pitcher of water that sat on Billy's nightstand. It sounds like you had a whopper of a panic attack. Oh no. Wait, was it actually a panic attack or was it, was it real? Because either way, it's kind of, kind of awful. She handed the cup to him. Billy at first thought he wouldn't be able to lift his hand and take the water. He didn't know why he thought that. He'd been drinking his, uh, his own water for three days. Billy's hand came off the bed and grasped the cup of water with no trouble at all. He took a drink and handed the cup back to Gloria. Then he repositioned himself in the bed. He wasn't sure why he was so relieved that he could do that too. Billy frowned. Why did he think he'd gone through something more than a panic attack the night before? Billy left the hospital the following week. His grandma brought him home. Last year, I fell and broke my leg, Billy's grandma said as she walked with Billy up a long wood ramp to a covered porch, stretching across the front of a, a small yellow cottage. That's when I heard, that's when I had all the ramps installed. I have to say that they make it easier to get around, even now that I have two legs to use it again. She glanced at Billy, who was stumping along next to her with his one leg and his crutch. Lucky, don't you think? Billy, concentrating on his ascent to the porch, didn't answer his grandma's question. Instead, he paused and looked up at this little house that his grandma lived in. Set in the middle of a wooded acre just outside of town, his grandma's house was surrounded by several flower beds and many thick clusters of dark green bushes with tiny leaves. Although Billy wasn't crazy about all the flowers, they look messy because there are too many of them, he thought, he found the bushes and the tall evergreen trees that encircled the house to be pretty. The house itself was pretty too. With a steep green metal roof and two dormers, the house was like ones he'd seen in magazines, places usually described as cosy or inviting. Billy supposed this house could be that. He just didn't know if he wanted to accept the invitation. But Billy followed her inside anyway and stopped in a small slate-floored entryway. The floor was covered with a yellow and blue rag rug, and the entryway's walls were blanketed with daisy motif wallpaper. Looking around, Billy remained silent. Lately, Billy had spoken as little as possible. Ever since he'd been told that he was being placed in his grandma's care, Billy had withdrawn into himself. Or maybe learning that he would be living with his grandma wasn't what had caused Billy's sudden desire to pull inward. Maybe it was something else. Billy had a feeling it might have had something to do with the night he couldn't remember. But then again, perhaps it didn't. Although the first few days of Billy's new life had felt exciting and hope-filled, Billy had realised that the world was way, way too big for him. Having spent the previous 16 years living as an animatronic, Billy was pretty much clueless about how to live as a man. A few days before, Dr. Lingstrom, no, Alice, or Ahi, had visited Billy again, and she'd explained to him that because he'd chosen to live as a robot for so long, his personality hadn't gotten to develop naturally as most children's personalities did. He basically had lived in what his former doctor had called an emotional and mental straitjacket. You may have memories of who you were before you choose to, uh, sorry, you may have some memories of who you were before you chose to live as an animatronic, ah, he had said, but those aren't enough to inform you who you are as an individual. It will take a bit of time for you to figure out who Billy is, what kind of person you want to be. Nature versus nurture, right? Billy's grandma uh, stowed her purse in the drawer of a small cabinet in the entryway and she hung up her cardigan on a mirrored oak coat rack attached to a compact bench. Turning, Billy's grandma studied him. Her, uh, her gaze went to his beanie, which she commented on at the hospital. Why are you wearing that silly hat? She'd asked when she'd picked him up. It covers my ears, Billy had told her. 
Perhaps a, a nice simple bandana would be better, she'd suggested. Billy had looked at her blankly, and she'd sighed and let the subject go. Now she frowned, whether about his hat or his continued silence, Billy didn't know. I feel like there's something wrong with the grandma. I feel like something's going to happen. I don't know. I don't know where it's going, but uh, it's interesting. Sighing, Billy's grandma pointed straight ahead toward a short hallway. Both bedrooms are down that hall on the right, just beyond the living room. She gestured over her right shoulder, and Billy looked into a cramped living room. Crammed full with an oversized yellow floral sofa, a large wood rocking chair with a padded green and beige striped sheet seat cushion, a yellow wing back chair, and a simple light coloured wood coffee table and two matching end tables, the room felt stuffy. Not thrilled with the profusion of flowers outside, Billy was even less happy with the flowery things outside, or inside, sorry. Besides the sofa's pattern, the room's wa yellow walls were covered in paintings of photographs of flowers and two vases stuffed with fle fresh flowers sat on end tables. Another vase filled with more flowers was perched on a thick wood mantle, maybe oak, above a pint-sized brick fireplace. Billy couldn't imagine sitting in the room. It would feel claustrophobic. In the corner of the living room, a heavily carved wood grandfather clock guarded the space. A big brass pendulum attached to a long rod swung back and forth inside the clock, filling the room with a tick that got on Billy's nerves. No, it was more than that. The ticking made him anxious. Why? The kitchen is that way, just through the dining room, Billy's grandma said, pointing to the left of the front door, toward the opposite side of the entryway from the living room. You probably don't cook, she said. Or do you? Billy knew how to cook the white foods he'd eaten as an animatronic, but he didn't want to eat those foods anymore. He figured he could learn to cook other things, but he didn't feel like explaining that to his grandma. He shrugged in answer to her question. Billy's grandma gave him a scathing look, the expression bunched up the many wrinkles around her small mouth. Then she shrugged in return. No matter. She stepped into a dining room barely big enough to hold a round, dark-coloured wood table surrounded by uncomfortable-looking straight-backed chairs with frilly yellow seat cushions. Come on, I'll show you the rest. It won't take long. She led him into a gallery-style kitchen with white cabinets and a yellow and green striped linoleum floor. The appliances looked old-fashioned to Billy. They had rounded edges and lots of chrome. Although his grandma's house was in a quiet area and all Billy had heard outside the house were a few birds tweeting and the wind rustling the tree branches, the inside of his grandma's house seemed noisy to him. To start with, it was filled with the big clock's endless ticking. Billy could still hear it clearly in the kitchen. It also had other intrusive sounds. The refrigerator's motor hummed loudly, and what Billy assumed was a furnace alternatively rumbled, oh, sorry, alternately rumbled and thumped. Um, leaving the kitchen through a doorway on its opposite end, his grandma turned right into a small hallway and pointed at a closed door. That's the pantry, she said. She continued on and pointed through an open doorway. Laundry room. Then she turned right again. Billy realised that they were coming out in the opposite end of the hallway that extended into the house from the entryway. The hall ran in a straight line from the front door to a back door next to the laundry room. They'd just done a loop, Billy realised, sta uh, starting at the entryway and going through the dining room and into the kitchen to end up at the back of the hall, opposite the front door. A narrow flight of stairs went up to the left of the end of the hallway. That leads to the second floor, Billy's grandma said. It's not much more than an attic. I use it for storage. Billy peered up the stairs and nodded. Billy's grandma turned away from the stairs and motioned for him to follow her down the main hall, heading back toward the front door. She waved a hand toward the left side of the hall. There are just the two bedrooms and one bath between them, she said as she led Billy down the hall. We'll have to share. Billy nodded again. Billy's grandma stopped in front of the first of three open doorways on the left side of the hall. This is my room, she said. She moved on and led Billy through the next doorway into a small room that held a double bed, a nightstand, a dresser and a desk. The bed was covered with a plain dark green bedspread. Billy looked around. He screwed up his face at the room's walls. They were covered with floral paper, tiny yellow rosebuds in a dainty pattern. On top of the wallpaper hung framed sketches of individual flowers. He tried very hard not to sigh, and he succeeded. Barely. 
That was a weird sentence. Anyway, <coughs> a weird detail. Uh, Billy was, as Ahi said he would be, still trying to figure out what Billy, the man, liked and didn't like. For sure, he didn't like florals. Maybe noticing the pinched look Billy had on his face, his grandma said, you can change this room to suit you. She cocked her head and studied him. But not if you intend to make it all grey and filled with metal like that house of yours. <laughs> Billy raised his head and studied his room. How would he decorate it if he chose? If he could choose? He wouldn't pick grey and metal again. That was B7's choice. Billy was going to have to figure out what he liked. At least he had a place to stay while he discovered his own tastes. How about you take a little rest? Billy's grandma said behind his back. I'll bring in your things after that. Billy turned and looked at his grandma. She raised a severely ached or se severely arched grey brow at Billy. I gathered up a few of your belongings from the house, she said, but then I brought you some new things too. You need colour, young man. Billy immediately felt guilt, or was it shame? He felt bad that his 82-year-old grandma was going to have to carry his possessions into the house. Billy didn't know much about how normal humans lived, but he was sure that they didn't let their grandmas lift things for them. Billy, however, could barely walk around, much less carry something. Even though Billy was no longer wearing a brace on his left leg, he ha he still had no trouble. He still had trouble, sorry, balancing on the one leg and the crutch. Um, Billy turned around again. He waited until he heard the bedroom door close, and he could barely hear his grandma's heavy footfalls. She wore heavy-soled shoes and clumped like a person twice her size. Then he turned and crossed the bare wood floor to the bed. There, sh there he sat and listened to the tick, tick, tick that went on and on and on. Forever and ever. Uh, Billy might not have liked his grandma much, and he didn't like the inside of her house, but he did like what she made for dinner that night. It was a red food, furthering his conclusion that he was going to want to eat a lot of red foods. You used to like lasagna when you were little, his grandma said, as she put a thick slab of pasta layered with cheese and red sauce on a green stoneware plate in front of Billy. Billy did still like lasagna, he discovered. It was great, so great that he finally spoke. This is really good, he said. His grandma tilted her, her head and quirked her lips for a few seconds. Then she said, thank you. She shook her head. It's going to take some time for me to understand you, she pointed at his mouth. How do you eat without a tongue? Very carefully, Billy said. His grandma barked out a gravelly laugh. It was the first time he could remember hearing her laugh, even in his childhood memories. He hadn't been trying to uh, be funny. It was hard he eating without a tongue. He had to concentrate to make sure he didn't get things stuck in his throat. After they finished their lasagna, his grandma gave him a slice of chocolate cake. The cake confirmed what he'd concluded about chocolate. It was his new favourite thing. Hmm... After his cake, uh, his grandma asked if he wanted to play some checkers. He told her he didn't know how, so she taught him. Checkers were okay, Billy thought. It was fun to play a game. Billy, however, decided he preferred video games. After the game, Billy went to his room. His grandma left his possessions on the floor by the door. He pushed them with his crutch over to the end of his bed. There, he sat down and went through them. He didn't find that, mu that mattered to him. <laughs> Imagine if it's like, Billy preferred video games to, to board games. Uh, he, he went into his room and pulled out FNAF v Virtual Reality. <laughs> it's like, he starts freaking playing FNAF and getting possessed by Glitchtrap. Uh, or, or just like FNAF games by Steve Snodgrass. That would be great. That would be such a cool way to connect it. Because so far, so far, none of this... Oh, I, well, okay, apart from Freddy and Friends at the start of B7, but none of this, except for that, really, is connected even slightly to FNAF. Not, not even, like... I, I was going to say none of it's connected to Tales from the Pizza... Like, it's a tale from the Pizzaplex. It's not even from the Pizzaplex, but, like, not even that. It's just not connected to FNAF at all, really, apart from Freddy and Friends. But it doesn't need to be. It's its own independent story, and that's why I love it so much. It's, it's really well written and really done. Uh, really well done. Um, his grandma had only bought from Billy's house a couple of items of his old grey clothing. The vibrant colours of the shirts she'd brought to go with a couple of pairs of new jeans made it clear what she thought of grey. 
The rest of what was in the box was toiletries and a few books. Billy frowned. Where was his computer? Standing, Billy went to his bedroom door. He opened it and called out Grandma. Oh, I, I could have put more expression into that. Grandma! Clumping sounded above Billy's head, then it came down the stairs. What is it, Billy? His grandma asked. She had a smudge of red paint on her cheek. The red looked like blood. It made Billy uneasy. Where is my computer? Billy asked. His grandma shook her head. You don't need a computer. All that digital stuff is part of what you got in trouble in the first place. That and TV. The mention of TV made Billy realise that he hadn't seen one in his grandma's house. Where is your TV? he asked. Maybe it was in a bedroom and he just hadn't spotted it. She shook her head. I don't have one. Filled with all, you, all kinds of nonsense TV. Like that show that started all your troubles to begin with. Ah, good point, good point. No computer, no TV. Before you ask, I don't have a cell phone either, Billy's grandma said. Billy raised his eyebrows and stared at his grandma. No cell phone? Good gracious, no. Infernal things, his grandma said after she took a few seconds to figure out what she'd said, what he'd said, sorry. Who didn't have a cell phone, Billy thought. Everyone had a cell phone. I have a good old rotary phone in my bedroom, his grandma said as if reading his thoughts. That's enough for me. Billy shook his head. I'm going to bed, he said. He needed to be alone. He needed to think. Sweet dreams, his grandma said. She watched him make a painstaking turn. Then she looked away from him. I feel like the grandma is... I don't know if if it's... If I find her sus because she is... Because she is sus. Or if I find her sus because this is a FNAF story. And it's not going to have a good ending. <laughs> uh, or, or, there, or there's going to be some sort of action sometime soon. I also just thought of something really funny. Which is unrelated. And it's that... Uh, Billy, Billy singling out white foods. And like white objects. And saying I, I'm not going to use them is a little bit like FNAF theorists picking out the colour green and saying, Oh, Charlie! <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> uh. Closing his bedroom door behind him, Billy leaned against it and shook his head. No computer, no TV, no cell phone, nothing but too many flowers and a clock that wouldn't shut up. Billy hadn't exactly lived a busy life as an animatronic, but his days hadn't been filled with silence. He'd nearly always been online when he was a robot. He'd spent lots of time on social media. He'd played online games and he'd watched hours of videos and done research on the internet. His brain had been constantly stimulated. He was going to lose his mind in this house. Literally put anybody today in a house with no technology and they will go insane in less than two days. I swear. I'd be happier in the hospital, Billy thought. At least they have TV. Tomorrow morning, Billy decided, he'd tell his grandma he wanted to go back to the hospital. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Billy wanted to go now, but he knew it was too late, and demanding to be taken back tonight would be rude. Even his newly developing human self understood that. Feeling better for having made his decision, Billy slowly got ready for bed. One of the things that his grandma had bought him was a pair of burgundy red pyjamas. He put those on, went out into the hospital, and headed toward the bathroom. Billy didn't hear his grandma moving around. She must have been in her bedroom, but if she was, she was silent. All Billy could hear was the refrigerator's hum, the furnace's rumble, and the tick-tick-tick of the grandfather clock. Billy went into the bathroom. After using the toilet, he brushed his teeth. Then he noticed he had a smudge of lasagna sauce on his jaw. The streak reminded him of the paint he'd seen on his grandma's face. Like the paint, the sauce looked like a smear of blood. Billy's hands started to shake. Trying to steady it, he reached for a washcloth that got it wet. And, and got it wet, sorry. When the wet terry cloth slid over the edge of the sink, Billy's breath caught in his throat. Behind the slippery sound, the tick-tick-tick of the clock suddenly sounded even louder than usual. Billy's breath started coming out in little gasps. His leg went weak. He sank down onto the closed toilet seat. I remember. He wished he didn't. Sweat beaded on Billy's forehead and chills racked his body. He felt like someone was pushing on his chest. I can't go back to the hospital, Billy thought. If Billy was in the hospital, B7 would find him. Billy took a deep breath and managed to find the strength to stand. Picking up the washcloth, he cleaned up his face, then he returned to his room. As Billy got under the crisp yellow sheets beneath the green bedspread, he heard a muffled trill. 
Billy froze and listened. The deep jangle started to repeat but was cut off. Billy realised he was tense and he shook his head at his overreaction. It was just his grandma's old rotary phone, he realised. Billy exhaled and settled in bed. Lying back on the pillows, Billy tried to ignore the relentless ticking of the grandfather clock. He closed his eyes and blotted out the flowers looking down at him from every wall in the room. Billy might not have liked it here, but he had to stay until he had his strength and had uncovered more of who Billy the person was going to be. He would be safer in this little country cottage, even with all its flowers and ticking. Here, he was not only far away from the hospital, he was far away from his old body and he wanted to keep it that way. Once he demanded that his uh, grandma's house was the best place for him to be, Billy made a concerted effort to get used to the flower-filled home with the ticking clock. One thing Billy had learned from looking back at his life as an animatronic was that he was good at immersing himself in a role. His role now was dutiful grandson, so he put all his energy into that. Within a few days of moving in, Billy had a routine going. In the morning, he had coffee with his grandma at the round table in the dining room. She got up before dawn every morning and baked, so by the time Billy was up, about 7am, there were muffins or pastries or coffee cake to go with the rich dark coffee. Eating his grandma's baked goods, Billy learned quickly that he'd been severely depri depriving himself of pleasure during the years he'd stuck to white foods. When they sat with their coffee, Billy and his grandma rarely spoke. He always had to concentrate to eat or drink without making a mess, and his grandma liked to do the crossword puzzle in the morning paper. The silence, though strained for a couple of days, quickly started feeling comfortable, and Billy started uh, feeling a fondness for the old lady with a perpetually sour expression. She seemed to be warning him, she seemed to be warming to him as well. She had stopped making comments about his striped beanie hat, and she no longer stared at his scars and missing limbs. She didn't sigh and frown around, uh, frown around him anymore, and her quick responses to whatever he said to her indicated that she was getting used to the way she spoke. He spoke, sorry. Ah! <laughs> Although the grandfather clock's ticking continued to pester Billy like a bothersome splinter under his skin, he started feeling better about it after his grandma explained that the clock had been made for her great 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 grandfather as payment for his services. Services. He'd been a doctor. It had been passed down through the family for over 200 years. When I'm gone, Billy's grandma told him, I wanted to go to your dad. Where is my dad? Billy asked. He hadn't thought about his dad in a very long time. After his dad had left, Billy, as B7, had found that it was best to wipe away any thoughts about his dad. It hurt less. Billy's grandma shook her head. I haven't heard from him in a year or so. Last time he sent me a letter, he was somewhere in Peru, working for one of those companies harvesting the, rain the rainforests. Billy's grandma sighed, and he knew she wasn't happy with Billy's dad. Fucking environment. <laughs> Why are they destroying the trees? After a couple minutes of silence, during which Billy and his grandma watched the grandfather clock's pendulum swing back and forth, his grandma said, Anyway, this clock will be yours someday. Then she showed him how to wind the clock so it kept going. This became part of Billy's regular routine, and he found that he developed affection for the clock. The ticking after that became more soothing than irksome. After breakfast and, and clock winding, Billy had other duties in his house. His grandma's baking created a lot of dirty dishes, and she had no dishwasher, so it became Billy's task to clean up the bowls and plans that she used. This was a tricky operation, given that Billy had just the one hand to use, and the one leg to prop himself on. But after a couple of days of getting the hang of it, he became adept at one-handed dishwashing, and his left leg got stronger and stronger. In addition to washing dishes, Billy took on dusting. He also became what his grandma called her fix-it man. When Billy had been an animatronic, he'd learned to do, a, uh, to do household repairs. He was adept at dealing with electrical and plumbing issues. His grandma's old house had plenty of those, so that kept him busy. In the afternoons, his grandma took a nap. While she was sleeping, Billy would sit her in her rocking chair in the living room. The chair sat next to the picture window, which looked out over the front porch and beyond it to the thick, bright foliage, providing a buffer between the house and the narrow country lane that led into town. 
Having gotten used to the crowded living room, so much so that it felt comfy now instead of cramped, Billy sat in the rocking chair to read, but he often looked outside. When he used his foot to rock the chair, he enjoyed the way the motion calmed him as he watched little grey birds flitting around in the bushes. After Billy's grandma got up from her nap, they would have tea. Tea wasn't actually tea, it was more coffee or sometimes hot chocolate, and they had it out on the front porch, no matter how chilly it was outside. Fresh air is important, Billy's grandma had said the first time she told Billy to bundle up so they could sit outside and have their tea. The cold air would put colour in your cheeks. Billy and his grandma sat together on the white porch swing every afternoon. They would sip their coffee or hot chocolate steaming in thick squat mugs and they'd work together unconsciously to get the swing swaying back and forth. Billy decided his body liked to be rocked. The sensation made him feel safe and relaxed. In the evenings after dinner, Billy and his grandma played games. Besides checkers, she taught him to play several other games. Dominoes, Chinese checkers, Monopoly and Scrabble. Although checkers didn't engage Billy much, he liked the rest of the games. He especially enjoyed Scrabble. He found he was good at it, probably because of all of the reading he'd done as an animatronic. His grandma was good at it too. They had close match, ga they had close match games that they both enjoyed. In spite of the slow pace of life at his grandma's house, Billy was tired at the end of the day. He was always ready for bed before nine. Each night, he'd slide under the covers exhausted, and, and as he settled in, he'd often hear, as if from a great distance, the deep ring of his grandma's phone. Billy idly wondered who was calling, but it wasn't any of his business. On the first Sunday that Billy lived with his grandma, five days after he moved in, their morning routine changed. When Billy got up, his grandma had told him to put on a good shirt and slacks, both of which she'd bought for him because they were going to church. The idea of church made Billy think of the Sunday school classes of his childhood, and he wasn't enthused about going, but he'd already learned that living with his grandma meant doing what she wanted him to do. Still, he was nervous about going to church. There would be people there, people who would stare at him and whisper about him. When Billy had been B7, he hadn't cared what others had stared, pointed or talked they he hadn't cared when others had stared, pointed or talked about him. The fact that others hadn't understood him had been irrelevant to him. Robots had no interest in the opinion of others. Billy, the man, however, did care about what others thought. Even after he started getting visitors in the hospital, Billy had been self-conscious about his scars and his missing ears and tongue and limbs. He knew that his life as B7 was something other people didn't understand. In fact, even Billy understood it less and less as the days went by. When Billy and his grandma walked through double doors into the small hundred-year-old wood church with the jutting steeple and the old bell that was ringing when they arrived, Billy discovered that he needn't worry about um, what people would do or stay around him. Only 37 people sat in the wood pews that day and every one of them treated Billy like he was just an ordinary guy. No one stared or pointed, no one whispered about him, no one cared what missing pieces uh, about his missing pieces or that he'd lived most of his life as a robot. He was accepted immediately. The service in the little church wasn't anything like the Sunday school classes Billy had hated. No one made him memorise anything or stand up and recite anything. All he had to do was sit in the pew next to his grandma and listen to the pastor, a kind-faced man with white hair that flopped over one of his friendly blue eyes. After the sermon, they sang hymns. Billy hadn't liked singing in Sunday school and church services where he was little, but now the singing surprisingly put him at ease, because, uh, perhaps because of all he'd been through. When the service was over, several people came over to say hi to Billy. Everyone seemed very happy to meet him and didn't bat an eye at the way he spoke. Do you like to fish, Billy? One man with a pointy goatee and a large belly asked. Billy's grandma introduced the man as Frank, and she said he made the best pickles she'd ever tasted. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, Billy said. I've never been fishing. Well, Frank said, clapping Billy on the shoulder, we'll have to remedy that. There's a good fishing spot not far from here that's easily accessible. I'll take you next Sunday after church if you'd like. Billy didn't know if he'd liked fishing. But he liked Frank, so he nodded. That would be great, he said. Billy was practically floating when he and his grandma got home from church. He couldn't stop grinning. Seeing his expression, 
His grandma grinned back at him, but she didn't ask about why he was happy. All she said was, go change your clothes, then we'll have Sunday dinner. Um, that evening, Billy went to bed earlier than usual. The day had been good, but being around people had sapped his strength. After Billy got into bed, he closed his eyes and thought about his day. For the first time, Billy felt like he could go forward without beating himself up for the bad choices he'd made, for all the lost time and for all of the damage he'd done to himself. Billy knew he still had a long way to go to understand who just Billy was, but at least he now felt like he had a clean slate to work with. Smiling, Billy rolled onto his side and burrowed further under the covers. Sleepiness started to quiet his mind. Just as he was drifting off, he had the ring of an old rotary phone. Something about the ring unsettled him, but he was too tired to figure out why. As the ring stopped, he fell asleep. The following week passed the same way the, the first one had. Billy found that the simple, quiet days suited him more than he'd thought they would. On some level, he was aware that the life he was living now wasn't typical for a guy his age, but he didn't care. He didn't think he'd want to live in the country forever, but for now it was just what he needed. It was giving him time to figure out what he did want to do. The daily routine was soothing, except for those few seconds at the end of the day as he was settling into bed. The ringing phone was bothering him more each time he heard it. Why am I concerned about it? He wondered. Was it the regularity of the calls? Was it the fact that his grandma never mentioned them? But then, why would she? She wasn't obliged to tell him everything she was doing. The second Sunday that Billy and his grandma went to church, Frank took Billy fishing afterward. Billy learned that fishing was kind of boring, but he did like sitting in a folding chair next to a river, shooting the breeze with Frank. Billy had been a little nervous about spending time with someone he didn't know. What would he say? But Frank was easy to talk to, an author who wrote pro pr private eye novels. Frank was really interesting and intelligent. He talked about his work in a way that made it sound like it was a lot of fun to make up characters and stories, so much so that by the time they were done fishing, Billy had decided maybe he'd like to be an author. When Billy had been growing up, he hadn't thought about what he was going to do as an adult. I don't know why I said adult so weirdly. Um, it's because I was going to say adult and then I was going to say adult and I kind of mixed them together. He was a robot. That was all there was to what he was going to do. Since he'd started his new post B7 life, trying to imagine what he'd do for the rest of his days had been way too much to contemplate. The time with Frank, however, showed Billy a future he thought he might really enjoy. With two limbs missing, Billy knew his options were a little limited, but he could write. What should I do if I want to be a writer? Billy asked Frank as they gathered up their fishing gear and walked away from the river. Write, Frank said. He guffawed, but then he sobered. Seriously, kid, he said. It's a cliche, but writers write. If you want to get good at any craft, you have to practice. So just start writing. When they got back to Frank's old red SUV, Frank dug around in the back seat and pulled out a plain lined notebook. I use these. I have cases of them. Frank handed the notebook to Billy. Billy took it and ran his hand over the smooth cover. Start keeping a journal. Write whatever comes to mind, Frank said. And Billy did. Writing became as much of his routine as spending time with his grandma. His days became happily predictable with two exceptions. The first exception was a good one. Every passing day, things got better and better between Billy and his grandma. Billy even discovered that his grandma had a fun side. The day after Billy went to church for the first time, his grandma asked him to help her in her flower garden. Still not a fan of flowers and still struggling to get around on one leg. Billy wasn't real keen on the idea, but he decided that dutiful grandsons helped their grandmas in the garden, so he went along with it. Luckily, his grandma had little stools for them to sit on while they worked. I don't get up and down so easy anymore either, she said when she brought out folding stools that had sturdy metal handles to help with getting up and down. I've been using one of these for years, she said. I bought a second one for you. Billy was touched by her thoughtfulness. Thank you, he said. He sat down and learned how to pull weeds and deadhead the flowers. They worked in silence for a bit, and then his grandma asked, What do you call it when a flower goes on a date with another flower? Confused, Billy stopped working and looked at his grandma. A budding romance, she said, and then she laughed her gravelly laugh. Billy laughed too. He hadn't known his grandma could tell a I don't get it. <laughs> a budding romance. What? 
Okay, I'm confused. <laughs> tell me, tell me the punch. Explain the joke in really simple terms in the comments below. What do you call flowers who are, um, what do you call flowers who are close friends? He asked his grandma. She raised an eyebrow at him. Her usually kinched, tight mouth stretched out in a smile. What? She asked. Billy had a feeling she knew what he was going to say, but then she let him say it. Buds, he said. They laughed together. Oh, is there something I'm missing? Is is part of the flower called like the bud or something? The bud of a flower? Is that like the center of a flower? No, because that's like the pollen and stuff. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> they laughed together. After that, Billy started liking flowers. The second exception to the pleasurable routine of Billy's passing days was his increasing disquiet regarding the mysterious nightly phone call. It rang at precisely 9.03. The phone never rang more than twice. Usually the second ring was cut off. Tonight, Billy was getting ready for bed a little later than usual. At 9.03, when the phone rang, he was just leaving the bathroom. When the ring cut off, Billy paused and listened. For the first time, he heard his grandma speaking to whomever who had called. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I told you grandma was sus. Billy took a couple quiet steps toward his grandma's bedroom door. He could only just barely hear her grandma's voice. She wasn't talking in her normal tone. Oh, is it his dad? She, w she spoke in a whisper that told Billy she didn't want him to hear the conversation, so Billy returned to his room. The next morning when he woke, Billy thought about what he'd heard the night before. Already on edge about the phone calls, Billy found that his grandma's hushed tone added to his unease. He tried to tell himself that a regular phone call wasn't a quiet deal, but he thought it was strange that the call came at the exact same time each night. It was strange enough that Billy really wanted to know who his grandma was talking to. Accordingly, uh, Billy decided he would spend he would time his pre-bed routine so he'd be in the hall again at the time of the call. This time, he'd try harder to listen in. He tried, but he couldn't make out her whispers. Each failed attempt at eavesdropping raised Billy's anxiety. Who was calling? Why 903? And why the whis whispering? What didn't Billy's grandma want him to hear? Billy wrote in his journal about these questions, but he didn't reach any conclusions. For over a week, even as he wrote about them, Billy told himself that the calls were none of his business. He should just ignore them. One night, though, his curiosity made him a little bolder when he listened by his grandma's door. Instead of standing by the door, Billy put the side of his head to the panelled wood, shifting his beanie so his ear canal was open to receive as much as possible. Billy listened hard. His grandma's whispered words were still too muted to hear. She was des she was definitely talking to someone because there were pauses in the whispering as if she was listening to whomever was on the other side of the line. Even though Billy knew it would have been wrong, he wished his grandma had a second phone in the house where he could have picked up another receiver and listened in. Something about the call's peculiar specific timing and his grandma's whispers were making him uneasy. These weren't normal just called to chat phone calls. Something was going on. Billy was becoming sure of it. But what can he do about it? Oh, I have a theory and it might be really depressing. This might sound like a really, really crackpot theory. In fact, I'm going to tell you right now, it is a crackpot theory. But if it happens, then you will have to, I don't know, like the video. <laughs> Uh, I have a feeling that the person calling is the remains of B7. And I also have a feeling that grandma isn't isn't fully real. Um, and, and what I mean by that is I, is I feel like grandma herself could be an agony entity. And, and that's all I've got. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to find reasoning for that belief but it, it just came to me and I feel like that could be where this is going I feel like grandma is evil in some way right I feel like grandma is on the b7 side it's it's really strange because it's really clear that she isn't but then that makes me think that she is even more I don't know let's let's listen to where the end of this story is gonna go over the next couple weeks, Billy got stronger and stronger. The residual pain from his surgeries had all but disappeared and he had learned to do pretty much everything he needed to do to take care of himself. He also was starting to get a sense of himself. He felt like he was ready to be on his own. 
Billy had surprisingly enjoyed the time with his grandma, but all the writing he was doing made him realise that if he was going to become an author, he needed to broaden his horizons. He needed some life experience beyond living in a country cottage, even beyond living in this town. Billy was so eager to get out into the world and explore, he even started looking into getting new prosthetics. Ahi, who had been coming out to visit Billy once a week, had brought him the information he needed to make his decision, and Billy had made arrangements to go for it. Oh, very nice. On a chilly Thursday evening, after sharing a dinner of beef stew and cornbread with his grandma, Billy decided it would be his last night with her. He didn't tell her that. He would tell her in the morning. Billy didn't think she'd be upset. Even though they were getting along great, his grandma seemed like she was becoming tired, as if maybe her, her, his presence in her home was starting to wear on her. She was moving more slowly and she was paler than she'd been when she'd first brought him home. His grandma went into her room early that night. That was fine. Billy wanted to do some writing anyway. For an hour or so, Billy wrote in his journal. By then, he was on his third notebook. Frank had bought a stack of them to church the week after they just went fishing. Just before nine, Billy got up to step out of the hall. He was still determined to try to figure out what the 903 calls were about, so he made sure he was near his grandma's bedroom door by 902. Billy waited in the hall for a minute. When the phone didn't ring, he checked his watch. It was 9.03. He still waited. 9.04. The phone didn't ring. Billy frowned at his watch and looked at his grandma's door. That's when he realised that he could hear her talking. Not whispering. Actually talking. Who was she talking to? Grandma? Billy called out softly. His grandma didn't respond. She just kept talking. Without thinking, Billy reached out and grasped his grandma's door handle. He turned it and pushed the door open. Realising he was being impolite but not caring, Billy stepped into his grandma's room. Billy hadn't been sure of what he thought he'd see when he'd intruded into his grandma's space. His grandma talking on the phone? A secret romantic caller? Something else? Whatever that something else might have been, Billy never would have guessed it would be what he saw when he looked towards his grandma's bed. Oh, uh, what, is, what, is, what is this going to be? I'm, I'm confused now. I'm very confused. I feel like it has to be... Maybe it's, what if it's Afton? What if it's like a glitch trap situation? I'm I'm very lost. I don't know what this, is, this could be. I don't know. Or maybe it is B7. Maybe it is um, the robotic parts coming back from the hospital. Something like that. I don't know. This is interesting. If he'd guessed, he never would have opened the door. Simultaneously, Billy's breath stopped and his heart rate tripled. For several long seconds, he couldn't even move enough to exhale or e inhale as he listened to his pulse pound in his ears. All Billy could do was stare at his grandma, which meant that she he was also staring at the thing that had come into his hospital room and terrorised him with exhortations to let him let it back in. So, okay, it's, it's the B7 robot amalgamation that we see on the front cover. Billy's boy... Uh, Billy's boy... Billy's body demanded that he take a breath. He opened his mouth and spasmodically gulped in the air. The sound he made was loud in the room. Um, but neither his grandma nor the horrible thing creeping over her noticed the noise. Accordioned into a pleated mass of metal and plastic, the thing, still stained with Billy's blood and encrusted with now drying bits of Billy's tissue, was inching its way up Billy's grandma's prone body. Every move it made emitted the clicks and squelches that Billy recognised from that night in his hospital room. His grandma, dressed in her usual combo of floral blouse and polyester pants, today's in pinks and purples, made no attempt to get away from the hideousness that was attempting to fuse itself with her. In fact, she was encouraging it. That was the talking Billy had heard. That's it, Billy's grandma was saying. I know you've been alone in the dark. You've been so lonely since Billy rejected you. That's why you called, right? I'm sorry I couldn't let you be with Billy again, but we've been bonding, haven't we? You don't have to be alone anymore. The conglomeration of parts surged upwards. It latched onto a polyester encased leg, uh, and part of its metal sunk into Billy's grandma's skin. Expecting his grandma's scream, Billy winced and started to rush forward, but his grandma didn't scream. She just kept talking. There was a strain in her voice, a breathiness that made it clear she was in pain, but her words were clear. Good, she said. I'm so happy you're here. His mouth opened in shock. Billy watched as the thing completely took over his grandma's leg. No, not took over. Replaced. 
His grandma's leg fell away from her body as the thing attached itself to her hip and kept stretching out further, reaching outward and upward to supplant even more of his grandma. As it moved, the crimping and shifting metal and plastic continued to make its signature clicking and sliding sounds. Those sounds were the stimulus that finally got Billy in, no in motion. Angry with himself for not going to his grandma's aid sooner, Billy started rushing toward her bed. That's when his grandma noticed him. Turning her head towards Billy, his grandma, seemingly unconcerned that her other leg was dropping away from her body, called out, Stop! Billy wanted to, con uh, to convince himself that she was talking to her attacker, but he'd seen enough to understand that she didn't see the thing as an attacker. Billy knew she was talking to him. Stay away, Billy, his grandma said. I want this. I'm ready to embrace this new life. Billy was unwilling to accept what he was hearing. Totally repulsed by what he was seeing and compelled to stop it, no matter what his grandma said, Billy took another step. No, Billy, his grandma choked out, her voice tight. Let it happen. She looked away from Billy, back down the length of her ruined body. Billy let out a mule of despair. How could he just stand there and watch his grandma possessed and mutilated by this metal and plastic creature, a creature that Billy, in essence, had created with his obsession and stupidity? Billy loathed what he'd been and what his existence had left behind. He couldn't bear to see the detritus of B7 take the grandma he'd only just come to love. As if in response to Billy's revulsion, the mechanical monster, now overtaking Billy's grandma's torso and working up, uh, up an arm, turned a head-like metal protrusion woven from plastic projections, a tangle of wires and sharp metal plates. Two of the plates parted, creating a mouse-like gap in the continually churning parts. I wanted to be with you, B7, the thing said to, Bi to Billy. That's where I'm supposed to be, but you wouldn't invite me back in. I sought out your grandma so I could be close to you through her. Billy didn't care what the writhing accumulation of metal and plastic had to say. What he cared about was the th that the thing had almost completely lay claim to his grandma. Its sharp edges were impaling his grandma's flesh, puncturing the skin between her ribs and burrowing deep into her torso. The thing was splicing open her slides, her sides, sorry, reaching past her bones, laying claim to her most vital organs. The metal and plastic invader was now almost 90% consolidated with his grandma's body. Three of her limbs had been severed. They lay on her bed, oozing blood, but not as much blood as Billy might have expected. It was like the mechanical interloper had cauterized Billy's grandma's flesh as it had usurped it. Rendered weak by the shock of what he was seeing and helpless by what his grandma had asked of him, Billy stood still. He wanted to look away from his grandma, but he couldn't. His gaze was riveted on her. That's why Billy noticed when the mass of parts started to twitch. The vibration was subtle at first, but it quickly became more violent. In a matter of seconds, the wreckage of B7 was quaking so hard that the bed's box springs squealed in protest. What's happening? Billy wondered. It almost looked like the thing was trembling in fear. Billy's grandma let out what sounded like a whoop of triumph. With her one ha remaining hand, she gripped on to the few metal and plastic parts that hadn't yet bonded themselves to her. The parts jolted, as if trying to resist, but Billy's grandma held on. She even smiled. That's creepy. <laughs> um, raising her head to look down the length of her now maimed body, Billy's grandma said, You understand now, yes? Well, I'm afraid it's too late to change your mind. You're stuck with me. Billy's grandma turned to look at Billy again. She kept hold of the parts that kept trying to flail away from her as she said, I've been terminal for some time now, dear. I didn't say anything because I didn't want to worry you. She looked back down at the creature that was fighting to free itself from her. She bared her teeth in a stained grin. Strained grin, sorry. Our friend here, though, should be very worried. Billy fell to sob well up, his eyes filled with tears. His grandma returned her gaze to Billy. Don't waste your tears on me. I've had a good life. I'm ready for this. She grimaced as she wrestled with the still thrashing metal and plastic. This morning I woke up and I knew today was my last day. I wanted to do this one last thing. The XB7 creature's metal parts lashed in a clear frenzy to escape. B7, help me, it called out. The pitiful appeal revolted Billy. 
He hugged himself with his one arm as the thing's click clicking sounds came out faster and faster, becoming a rapid fire din that filled the bedroom. The collection of metal discards fought furiously to free itself from Billy's grandma, but its efforts weren't enough. Billy's grandma's intention was too strong. She forced the last of the parts to meld with her arm, and she exhaled in relief as that arm spilled away from her body. Still holding Billy's gaze, his grandma said, Don't grieve for me. It's time for you to live. Have a good life. Be true to yourself and be kind to other people. Her face now deathly pale, uh, Billy's grandma swallowed and licked her lips. Then she winked at Billy, and go to Sunday school. She gave Billy a small smile. Billy felt tears slide down his cheeks as his grandma let out one last long exhale. She went still. Remaining rooted, Billy continued to stare at the mac macabre uh, composite of his grandma and the still convulsing B7 parts. The metal and plastic were moving weakly now, and with every second that Billy watched them, they slowed. Finally, the mechanical monster stopped moving completely. The clicking ceased. Billy looked from his grandma's staring eyes to the rigid motionlessness of the metal and plastic parts. He could see that it was over. Both his grandma and what was left of Billy of B7 were dead. That's an interesting way for the story to go. I didn't think it would go this way, but it's almost over. Two, two more pages and we're done. When it was all over, <laughs> Billy wanted to just leave his grandma's house and forget what he'd just seen. He couldn't, however, leave her like that, so he sat with her for the rest of the night, and in the morning he used the rotary phone to call Frank. Frank helped Billy bury his grandma, and the dregs of B7. He then drove Billy to the hospital so Billy could start the process of getting his new prosthetics. I'll be sure her house is taken care of for as long as you need, Frank told Billy as Billy got out of the old SUV. Thank you, Billy said as he balanced on the crutch that he expected he wouldn't need for much longer. Billy stepped back. Frank leaned out and gave Billy a long look. Go forth and have adventures, young man, Frank said. You have to experience life to write something interesting. Billy nodded and lifted his hand to wave as Frank drove away. Then Billy made his way into the hospital. Two weeks later, Billy called, uh, walked out of the hospital without his crutch. He now sported two new prosthetic limbs. His new arm and leg were the latest in flesh-coloured, real-looking prosthetics, and Billy had gotten used to them quickly. Striding away from the hospital and wearing jeans and a bright new red shirt that went great with his striped beanie, into which Billy had tucked a small carnation, a tribute to his grandma, Billy thought about the first adventure he intended to have. He'd been living with Clark and Peter while he went through the process of being fitted for his prosthetics. It had been great to hang out with them and get to know a few other guys, but he intended to stay with them for just one more night. It was time for him to get on with his life. Not at all sure whether he was making the right choice, but feeling like it was something he had to do, Billy bought a ticket to Lima, Peru. He intended to try to find his dad. Both terrified and hopeful, Billy was ready to throw himself into the unknown. He wasn't sure how the trip would unfold. Maybe it would be good, maybe not. But either way, he figured he'd end up with a life experience worth writing about. That was... That was a really cool... Uh, well, that was a really sweet ending, right? Very sweet ending. I love how it ties back into him wanting to be an author. But I don't know how I feel about this story. I feel like it's quite weak. I'm not going to lie. I wasn't too into it. Um, and, and, that, and that's just my opinion. Of course, you, you can make your own opinions. And, and I, I won't force you to um, to dislike it, of course. But my overall opinion of that is I don't think that was really needed like I, I don't I don't see much relevance in it and I don't really see why B7 had to be a two-parter um I guess if you want to hear more about my opinion on this then make sure that you subscribe to the Dark Rooms podcast which I am on because we will be talking about all of these books um well we, we have been talking about all these books and we will be talking about B7 too as well soon so make sure you do that so anyway let me know what you thought of this story, whether you liked it more than me, and, uh, and next time we will be covering Alone Together. Uh, Alone Together, and I have no idea what that story is going to be about, so that's all going to be a total surprise. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.